So welcome to lab two. This lab is about pressure measurements, and we're going to do a continuation of flow visualization with particle image velocimetry, or PIV. So we're going to split up into three groups and do three different stations. In each station, in two of the stations, we'll be taking pressure measurements. In one station, we'll be PIV. And we'll go through each station individually in a bit. To begin with, let's talk about, a little bit about pressure. So, how do you define pressure in your own words? We can write pressure is equal to a force per area. But we can also think about it in terms of an energy per unit volume. And this definition will come in handy later on in the quarter when we talk about Bernoulli's equation, which is a form of energy balance. We'll see a term in Bernoulli's equation, which is pressure over density, which if you look at pressure in terms of energy per volume, you see this equation has units of energy per mass. So keep that in mind. Okay, so units of pressure, we all know that pressure is a uh, newton per meter squared is a newton. So a newton per meter squared is a pascal. So we can talk about pascals. And how many pascals are in the atmosphere? 101.25. Pascals equals one atmosphere. What else? We have the bar. And bar is defined as, well, there's 10 to the fifth pascals in one bar, which is approximately equal to one atmosphere. But note that they're not exactly the same thing, so when you hear about atmospheric pressure, make sure you know whether it's in atmospheres or in bars. What else? We have uh, millimeters of mercury. Popular back when mercury wasn't known to be super unsafe. Now we'll use water instead of mercury to measure pressure using height differences. And we know that there are 760 millimeters of mercury in one atmosphere. And this is also equal to a tor capital T-O-R-R-R, -R -R. millimeters, sorry, we'll use inches of water is another one. We're going to use it in this lab quite a bit. And there are 406 inches of water. I believe there are 406 point some inches of water in one atmosphere. And if you're a scuba diver, you know the uh, rule of thumb where if you de descend 10 meters underwater, the pressure you feel increases by one atmosphere. So that will be in SI units with water. Uh, anything else for, for pressure? I believe that's all the units of pressure we can think of. Oh, PSI, PSI. Pounds per square inch. There are 14.7 PSI in one atmosphere. And we can also think of pressure at, at a more microscopic level as in, uh, uh, collisions that are occurring between fluid particles and the surface of interest. And the study of, of this field where we talk about the properties of the fluid and use those properties in order to calculate pressure is called kinetic theory. So pressure is measurable or calculate, calculable on a microscopic level if you know certain properties like the mean free path, the temperature, etc. for the fluid itself. Okay, so with that, let's talk a bit about each station. So again, we'll split up into three stations. So the first station, we'll be doing PIV, particle image velocimetry. The second station, we'll be calibrating an electronic pressure tr transducer and using that electronic pressure transducer to measure pressure drop along a duct. And we're going to use the data that we collect here later on in the quarter for a homework assignment. So make sure that we collect the data, we know what our file name is, and we keep track of it in a safe manner. The third lab, third part of the lab, will be taking height measurement using a pressure difference. So you've calculated in your pre-lab the 
height, your pressure difference based on your height. Now we're going to go backwards and calculate what your height is based on the pressure difference from your feet to your, to your head. And we're going to look at how to use a, a floor manometer, a long manometer that uh, is, has high resolution, so you get up to a thousandth of an inch resolution on this manometer. And we're going to use it to calculate flow rate through uh, a device called laminar flow element, which I'll talk about in a bit. So with that, let's go through the different pressure, device, pressure measurement devices in the lab. So look around the room and see what pressure measurement devices you can see. So let's go left to right over here. We have our digital barometer, which is pretty straightforward to use. We simply plug it in, wait for it to calibrate itself. And the units on this guy are for uh, meteorological purposes. So you often get hectopascals or millibar. So when you do use it, you're going to have to convert your units correctly. There has a, there's a port in the back right here, which looks like it's about six centimeters or so from the, from the surface of the, of the table. So when you are calibrating, when you're measuring your pressure at your toes or your head, make sure that this offset is the same on both your toes and on your head. So it looks like the atmospheric pressure right now is 1,000 and 7.5 millibar. Okay, so this right here is another manometer, super simple manometer. There's a port up here and a port down here. We're measuring delta P between them. We're going to use this one just sort of as a fun device. You can blow into it and see how powerful your lungs are. It's fun to kind of see how long your lungs can, can maintain a certain pressure. And this is uh, the, the reason why snorkels are the height that they are is because your lungs aren't powerful enough to push a lot of water a certain, uh, uh, beyond about 12 or 15 inches high. This is the, the floor manometer I was talking about a second ago. So this is a clever piece of uh, engineering. We're calculating, measuring the pressure difference across these two taps. One tap is fed down back here to a reservoir, which is at the same level as the green fluid right now. It's just water with green food coloring in it. And to measure a delta P across these things, first we want to zero it, so we have the fluid levels being the same. So I'll, I'll increase the crank here so that we get our green fluid into the slanted region. The slanted region is nice because we get extra resolution there, because it's small H equals a big change in our distance along the slant. And I'll stop it right as it gets to the meniscus, or right as the meniscus gets between the black lines. So that's fairly good. That's zero. That's when we have zero gauge pressure. And there is a reading on this device. It looks like it's reading zero tenths of an inch. And then down here at the bottom, there's another dial, which is reading 56 thousandths of an inch. So right now we would be 0.056 inches as our zero level. Now I would apply a pressure differential across the taps via our blower here, which is sucking in air from the lab through the tubes and around. So we'll do that real quick. After we plug it in. And it's fun, to, it's often insightful to think about which direction the fluid will move given which direction the flow is coming from. I didn't do that. So now the pressure differential is causing the fluid to rise on one side. So now we can re-zero the device, making sure we know what the number was beforehand, and we'll get that delta P. So I'll let you guys figure this out when you have to use this station, but that's the general principle. Also note that on this device there's a thermometer here which will be useful to calculating, for calculating the density of air right now in this room. Hint, ideal gas law. Alright, so that's the floor manometer. Working our way around further we have this well comparison manometer. So we're comparing pressure differences along this tube. As we turn on the blower we'll notice changes in pressure through the nozzle, above the nozzle, below the nozzle, at the exit of the tube, 
and we can use it to calculate pressure difference between in a, uh, between static pressure and uh, static and stagnation pressure in a pitot tube, which we'll talk about in a, in a lab, I think, in three weeks. Um, the slant manometer uses the same principle as the floor manometer we just talked about. You'll see that the numbers read from zero to four, and there's a four inch height difference between the bottom of the fluid and the top of the, of the ruler. So that means that there's a factor of three increase in resolution. This is a 12 inch. 12 inches spread, or, or four inches spread across 12 inches, which means that we have three times the increase in resolution using the slant manometer. All right, working our way further. We're going to come back to this device in a second, but this is a pressure sensor. So we'll notice on this setup here, there's a gauge, and it's reading in PSI. So that's going to be a pressure measurement device. These gauges are all over the place. You've probably seen them you know, in, in inflating tires. They're called Bourdon gauges, B-O-U-R-D-O-N. And the way they work is very clever. You'll notice, so we've got one here, we're going to look at the back side. You'll notice there is a flexure here, an element which is hollow inside, which is, which is flexible. The hollow, the inside, interior of this is exposed to the same pressure as in our is in our reservoir tank we want to measure. And the amount of surface area exposed in this direction is greater than the amount of surface area exposed in this direction. Since pressure is, it acts isotropically, the net force on this element, since there's more surface area exposed in this direction, is going to pull the, it's going to un unfold this flexure. So as the pressure increases, the, the, the element opens up and there's a nice mechanical linkage here, tunable with different distances and different spring constants if you want to calibrate it, which is attached to a gear, which is then attached to a small spur gear on this shaft here, which is then attached to the dial. And on the back side of here, there's also an electronic pressure transducer, which I'll, again, I'll talk about the principle behind that in a second. So we're reading it visually and uh, on the computer. We're measuring that pressure twice. Working our way around further, nothing much to see here. Sometimes people will think this is a pressure measurement device. It is a measurement device, but it's not for pressure. We're going to use this to measure flow rate. So the numbers here read from 0 to 100, which is a percentage. So it's a percentage, it's a percentage of maximum flow. This device here is calibrated for 34.6 cubic feet per minute at 100% at maximum flow. And we read the level of the flow right at the top of the taper of that bobbin. So right where it opens up like this, we're going to read it at that top. Right now it's reading 12% or so, but it's actually at zero. Alright, there's a nice green manometer here. This is an obvious pressure sensor. It's called a microtector, and it's used, we're going to be using it to calibrate our electronic pressure transducer. And the way this is works, this, the way this works is, is really clever. So there's two taps, one here, one here. When we apply a low pressure to this tap, the water level will rise this direction. And you'll see there's a metal probe over here, which is screwable, up and down. When the water level rises, it's going, the probe will become submerged. And if we apply a voltage across the, from the probe down to the bottom of the, of the manometer, you'll see there's copper tape which connects the bottom of the fluid to the probe. If you apply that voltage and you stick the probe in, since water is conducting, you're going to have some current flowing. And the amount of current that flows in, in, this, in this system will be proportional to the surface area that the probe is submerged. So we can get very accurate measurements on how high the water moves based on how much surface area is exposed, how much surface area of the probe, probe is exposed. So the way this works is as follows. Right now it's in the off position. We'll turn it on. And the probe is not submerged, so there's no current flowing. This is reading in microamps. What we'll do here is we'll, zero, we'll find a 
a reference current. We're going to say 20 microamps is our reference current. And we'll submerge the probe just enough so that 20 microamps are flowing. Okay, 20 microamps. And we'll notice that this is, this is a, a mic micrometer which has accurate height measurements here. This is reading tenths of an inch, and each tenth is split up into four segments, which is reading one quarter of one tenth, which is one fortieth of an inch. And then on the spindle up here, or on the thimble up here, you'll notice there's 25 markings. And one revolution is 25 markings, so one twenty-fifth of one fortieth makes a thousandth. So we've got tenths, fortieths, and thousandths in here. Okay, so right now we'll, we'll keep it at 20 microamps. And we read the level. This is the, our, our reference level. And if we apply a pressure differential between the ports by turning on flow through the channel, let's do that really quick. You'll notice that the probe is submerged far enough that the current flowing is beyond the maximum level on the gauge. So we'll back out the probe back to 20 microamps, slowly, and we'll read that new level on the micrometer. The difference in height there is one half of the pressure difference between these two levels. So the way that we're going to use this is we're going to have one end connected to this tap in the in the duct. The other end of the duct, the other, other end of the tap is hooked up to this black box. This black box is called a capacitive pressure transducer and it's it's electronic so we're going to be able to take measurements electronically. And the way this works is it uses the uh, uses capacitance to sense pressure. So the inside, the interior looks like this. So there's a capacitor has two parallel plates, right? And the capacitance is proportional to A over D. The separation, A is the area of the plates and D is the separation between the plates. So if you change D, you can pick up different capacitance values in your circuit. And we change D by simply applying a, a, a force on, a net force that pushes the plates one way or the other. So there's one port open here, other port over there, and it's just as simple as applying a different pressure across them and changes the, the separation. So we're going to use our micro microtector to calibrate our capacitive pressure transducer. Now, the capacitive pressure transducer, I think that the, the, the same principle applies to the other transducers we saw uh, on the other part of the other side of the lab, where it's a pretty cheap device. There are other types of electronic pressure transducers. There's piezoresistive, piezoelectric, where if you apply a force on a piezoelectric or piezoresistive material, You'll either get a change in, in voltage or a change in resistance, respectively, across this, this substance, and you can pick up that with a circuit. But this is capacitive. So we'll make sure that the power supply is turned on and the voltmeter is turned on. This is reading volts, so we want to be able to get a correlation between volts and pressure. So we'll use the black box to give us volts, and we'll use the microtector to give us pressure, and we'll take pre measurements at a bunch of different flow rates in the duct, and we'll get a calibration curve for what a delta V, what a, what, a, what a voltage corresponds to in terms of pressure. Once we have that calibration curve, we can use our capacitive pressure transducer to measure the pressure drop as we work our way along the duct. So one of the stations in this lab is particle image velocimetry, PIV. And this is our PIV setup in this lab. It's an educational PIV model. It's, uh, it's small. And we're going to be measuring flow. So last week we did qualitative flow analysis in the water tunnel and the snow tunnel. This week we're going to do a quantitative flow analysis so that we get a quantitative understanding of the velocity field around an object. And our object of interest is, is this black device here. It's just a, a, a shape that looks basically the same as any one of these different shape but it's the same uh, same concept and we are putting it in this channel with flow coming around this way and then back around this way and we're going to send flow around it's a two-dimensional 
we're going to get two-dimensional information about the velocity field. And the way it works is we seed the flow with particles, with seed. So we're going to be using this polyamide seed, or you can use hollow glass seeds, both of which are very, very fine in diameter. It's just 50 microns in diameter. And they both have similar specific gravity to water, or they have close to one specific gravity. That's because we need the particles to not sink, so we get accurate representation of the flow field. Um, we need the particles to be small because we, A, we want high resolution, we want to have multiple data points within a small region. We also don't want them to be too massive because if they're too massive, then there requires a large amount of force to move them, to make them curve in the same pattern as the flow. So it's a matter of inertia. If you have too massive of a particle, you need more, more pre a higher pressure difference in the flow to cause it to curve. And that might not be enough to cause it to curve to, to match the flow field. So this, this is going to stick into the slot here. And there is a laser which shines a sheet of light this direction, which lights up the particles and causes them to reflect light, some of which comes vertically this way, and is incident on a camera sensor which is up here. So there's a camera taking pictures this way, and the light going this way. And the way PIV, the, the, the quantitative portion of PIV works is you take a series of pictures at increments in time and you capture every single dot in the frame and then you try to track where those dots move. And you have a statistical algorithm which makes the best approximation for where those dots probably went. And then you have a summation of different pairs of PIV images and then we average the results from all of those and we get a pretty good, sometimes pretty good, representation of the flow field. So let's turn this thing on and take a look at how it works. But before we do, actually, I want to show you real PIV setup. So this is an experiment, uh, you know, an educational one. But let's go to the computer over here and take a look at some real PIV. So here's a, an image of a helicopter, the rotors and body in a large wind tunnel. This is the biggest PIV experiment that have ever been conducted. And what they did is they shined laser light at this image. They seeded it with oil, oil vapor, oil droplets that are small and have the same density as air. And they took, camera, they took images at different angles so they could re recreate a 3D velocity field. So that would be a way of calibrating a computational fluid dynamic simulation or uh, quantifying turbulent characteristics. It's a way of, it's, a, it's an, another technique to understand flow around an object. Oftentimes you'll start with an analytical representation or a quantitative prediction, like computational fluid dynamics. In our case, we, could, we ran a su super simple CFD algorithm, which is available online, equations in motion or wind tunnel 2D, fun to play with, which gave us streamlines that look like this, and we're going to try to represent this, we're going to try to recreate this uh, experimentally. So that's one application of PIV with, you know, a, some sort of aerospace helicopter design. There's also, there's been some pretty cool work done on how birds fly. So a group at Berkeley took birds, put them into a wind tunnel, and seeded the air with uh, olive oil droplets and then sent birds flying through the flow and they captured the flow around them. So these are some cool images. It's a New York Times article on this which I find fascinating. This is their wind tunnel and their bird is sitting inside of it. And So you see there's a, a pretty detailed velocity profile of the flow around the wing of this bird. You can see the vortex around the wing which causes, which generates the lift on the wing. You'll see these, these vortices that are coming off the tips of the wing. And this stuff is so, it's so hard to quantify, it's so hard to, uh, to run a computer model for a bird because we don't know how the bird wings flap exactly. This is a really good way of seeing how flow happens around an object. All right, so let's go back to the setup here. Take some pictures really quick. Okay, so let's look at the computer interface for PIV. You'll notice that there are, there's an icon called camera control. 
camera control gives us a window of what the camera is seeing. Right now the machine is off, so we see black. There's a button on the back right of the machine. I'm going to turn the machine on. And we see what, what the camera is seeing. So the concentration looks pretty good. It's pretty uniform and it's not too concentrated. If you let the water and seeds sit in the machine for long enough, you'll start seeing a film of particle particulate on the top surface. They look like bubbles, but they're actually little seeds. So if that happens, we'll need to empty the machine, rinse it out, and then refill it with fresh seed and fresh water. So the camera control interface gives us some settings with brightness, contrast, etc. Uh, we'll have to play with those to get the settings correct. The notice that the saturation is at zero. If we keep it at non-zero, we see green because the laser is, is green. And the exposure, we can change the exposure, which changes the image quite nicely. I think these settings look pretty good for now. And so what I'll do is I'll notice that the, the percentages of maximum of these settings and quit out. Open up the FlowX web interface. This page just tells us how the system works. Then there's a page on how to set up the system, which we've already gone through. Then there's a page on acquiring images. So what we're going to do now is we're going to acquire a series of 10 frames. We're going to specify brightness, exposure, and gain. Now, PIV includes a lot of parameters to get the settings perfect. So I'm going to avoid some hassle here, and we're going to use settings that I know have worked in the past. So you'll notice up here on the wall we have uh, some settings for a experiment done winter 2000, spring 2013. Brightness 60, exposure 80, and gain 100. Those are percentages. So I'm going to recreate that over here. 60 for brightness, 80 for exposure, and then 100% for gain. And I'll keep it at 10 frames. The more frames we take, the less error there will be in the result because we're going to be averaging over more PIB pairs. But it also takes longer to comp for computation. So we're going to keep it at 10. I'll click Capture, let the machine do its work, taking pictures. Now I'll go to the Analyze tab. Now we're going to stitch these images together. So it's showing right now the first two pairs, the first two images. So you'll see the dots move as expected. And in order to run the statistical algorithm to calculate the velocity field, we need to specify a few more parameters. So there's the window size down here, shift size, and the number of pairs. Well, first, pairs is easy. We took 10 pictures, which means we'll need nine pairs. So the first, second picture, second, third picture, and so forth. So I'll make nine pairs. Then the window size is the size of an interrogation window in the view field, such that the particles will get one velocity magnitude per interrogation window. The shift size is the number of pixels that the particle has to go before the algorithm decides that's actually a new particle. So ideally we'll have one particle move within every shift size, square shift size window. There can be multiple particles per window, but we're going to average all the velocity vectors and magnitudes in that window, we'll get one magnitude, one direction. And I'm going to put it at 40 pixels for window size and 20 pixels for shift size. So far we've got brightness, exposure, and gain. Those are three parameters. We have the window size and shift size. Those are five parameters. Plus we have the speed at which the fluid is flowing, which we can control at 6, and the concentration is 7. So that's 7 parameters in PIV, all of which are related to each other, and you have to get them all fairly good in order to get a good image, a good set of images. So notice that PIV is hard to calibrate, as with any engineering system. It takes some, some iterative process to get to the correct result, so or appropriate result. So just bear with us here when we, we're going to take some images that are probably not going to turn out great but we would do this iteratively in order to get a good uh, set of images. So I'll click, ref after I click process rather, we'll let the machine run its, run its computation and we're going to talk a little bit about, about how to val validate PIV while this is doing its thing. So if we have steady flow happening inside the box, which we do right now, a pump is a steady flow pump, 
we know that the mass flow rate inside the channel will be constant at the inlet and the exit. There's no accumulation of mass. Now to calculate mass flow rate for uniform velocity profile, we know it's just rho VA. But for a non-uniform velocity profile, the velocity is a function of distance in that channel. So we have to perform an integral of integral of rho V dA. And that dA for a rectangular channel, we know is a width times a dL, which means that we need velocity information V as a function of L. Now, for any arbitrary flow, we wouldn't have that. PIV gives us, so I'll we'll click the refresh button once we've got the analyze finished, and we see a pretty nice velocity field. The colors are the magnitudes and the arrows are obviously the directions. So PIV gives us the velocity, magnitude and direction as a, dis as a function of length along the channel. So what we can do is we can perform an integral on the inlet and the integral at the exit and anywhere in between of the integral of rho v dA and that, that should come out to the same thing. Now rho is a constant that can come out. The width is a constant that can come out. So we're left with rho times w times the integral of v dL. Now we have v as a function of L so we can perform that integral. Now it's more than just the integral of v dL because we need the component of velocity that's in the direction of of the, of the surface normal, so it would be V cross DL if we have length going in this direction and velocity going in that direction. So that would be a way of validating PIV. Our setup here looks like it has a few mistakes. There's no velocity on the exit and their velocity on the inlet is not being registered entirely. This is sort of to be expected. This is an educational system. Uh, it's not perfect. And there's also a lot of parameters that we need to tweak to get the settings to be just right. Okay, that's all for PIV. Alright, so now we're going to move over to the other station. At this station we're going to do two things. We're going to use this digital barometer to measure our, the pressure difference between our toes and our head and use that to calculate our height. And we're also going to measure the pressure difference across the laminar flow element we have installed in this system up here. So let's start with the height measurement. So this is super simple. I've got my digital pressure gauge, it's reading it in millibars. And I will use a partner. First I'll put it on the ground at my toes. And I'll let it sit there and, and calibrate itself for a second. Let it reach equilibrium. And I'll write down what that number is. And I'll bring it up to the top of my head. And I'll hold it with the same offset from the top of my head that there was on the ground. And I'll let it sit here for a few seconds, let it equilibrate, and then I'll have a friend read it off to me because I certainly can't read it. And so now I have my delta P. In order to calculate H, I'll need to know the density of the medium in which I'm standing in, which is air. So I could use a standard value for air, 1.22 kilograms per meter cubed, or I could calculate it on my own in this room, which is preferable. So to do that, we'll use the ideal gas law. So we'll need temperature, and we'll need R for air, which is 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And to find temperature, we'll use the thermometer in this barometer, this, this um, pressure gauge right here. So it's reading, oh, I don't know, 20 C. So I'll use all those variables, and I'll run my calculation, and I'll measure the difference between my toes and my head. And I'll look at the error I have, and it could be fun to, to, to uh, uh, store all the errors for everyone in the class so that we can get uh, a histogram of errors that should be normally distributed, maybe if the pressure sensor is, has, has random error. It's also interesting to look at the resolution on the pressure gauge here. Looks like it's one hundredth of a millibar and to see what that means, how that corresponds to height. So what is the resolution in height? Assuming this pressure measurement is accurate, what is the resolution in height? So what's the accuracy of this uh, pressure gauge? That can be fun to do as well. So that's that part of the station. The other part of the station is we will calculate the, or measure the pressure drop across the laminar flow element. Now this thing you can go online and buy. It's installed in your system so to calculate, uh, to, sorry, to measure flow rate. And we have a calibration curve given a delta P, what will be the flow rate? 
And then we have that on the wall over here, which is a linear relationship between delta P in inches of water and then Q in standard cubic feet per minute. Okay, so with that, we'll, we'll turn on the system. There's a blower right here. Turn that guy on. So first thing we notice is that there are all these taps here are hooked up to the well comparison manometer. You'll notice that there's a pretty large delta P in these two, which corresponds to the flow through the nozzle, which we'll talk about in a later lab. So as the flow is accelerated, the velocity increases and the pressure decreases. The decrease in pressure corresponds to an elevated water level over here. Uh, and the pressure does some interesting stuff at the exit of the nozzle too, as it expands out to, to uniform velocity profile. What we're going to use though, is we're going to use this floor manometer to measure the delta P. So I did not zero this thing before I turned it on. So what I'll do is I'll turn the blower off for a second, zero it, and then turn the, the blower back on. So as I said before, there's a reservoir in the back of this device which we can't see right now. But by raising and lowering the reservoir with, a, with no pressure across it, I can read the other side as well. And I want it to be just so that the meniscus is in between the black lines. That's pretty good. So that I'm reading 0 tenths and 54 thousandths. So 0.054 is our 0. I would write that number down so I don't forget it. And now I'll turn on my blower. So now there is a delta P across the back of this res the back reservoir and the free surface of, of this tube up here. So I want to re-zero it now, knowing that it was at 0 0.054. I'll back it down. Just about got it, and now I'm at 0.5, so 5 tenths and 30 thousandths, so 0.53. So 0.53 minus 0.054 is 0.476. So I have 0.476 inches of water as, as my delta P. Now this is only one half of the delta P. But our calibration curve is made such that we're only reading this delta P here. So I'll go to my chart and I'll look at point, what did I say, point 0.4 something? So let's just say it's about point 0.5 and that corresponds to about, oh, I don't know, 70 cubic feet per minute. So now we know the flow rate in our, in our, in our system. So that's all there is for this station. It's a fairly simple station. Uh, if you have extra time, you can try blowing into the this manometer to see how powerful your lungs are. See how long you can sustain a certain pressure? That's all there is for this station. Alright, so now we're in our third station. At this station, we're going to use our micro detector to calibrate our digital, our, our capacitive pressure transducer, and then use the capacitive pressure transducer to take measurements of pressures along this duct. So, first, we need to calibrate this guy. So, to do that, we're going to take Measurements at this pressure tap, which is hooked up to both devices, was hooked up to both devices, via this elbow joint. So we're going to be taking pressure in the same, same location on the pipe. We'll notice that on the micro detector, this port is turned up. If you turn it right, it's going to be closed. So keep this vertical as you take measurements. Um, to turn the flow on, so we're going to take pressure measurements with a bunch of different flow rates. So we need to be able to turn the flow on. So we'll do that with the vacuum cleaner. And it's hooked up to a variable voltmeter. So if I'll turn that on, 
and I change the voltage applied to the vacuum cleaner, I can change the flow rate. And the flow is being measured, like I said before, with this variable area flow meter, which is giving us a percentage of, percentage of maximum flow. For the calibration portion of the station, we don't need to worry about the flow rate. So first, we're going to take a measurement at zero volts, or, or sorry, zero volts applied to the vacuum cleaner, so zero flow rate. That will give us our, our zero value for our micrometer. So the way this is going to work is I'm going to take height measurements with the micrometer where I want a given amount of current to flow. I'm going to use 20 microamps as my reference current, and I'll keep the needle on the 20 microamp level, and I'll read this height. The way to read the height is you look for the, inc the incre increments on the sleeve of the micrometer. Right now it says 5. That's 5 tenths of an inch. And then the next line above that would be 40ths of an inch, and I see 0 of those. So we've got 5 tenths, 0 40ths. And then the numbers on the thimble are the thousandths. And I'm looking at, once I get this back to 20 microamps, I'm looking at 8 thousandths. So I've got 5 tenths and 8 thousandths. That's my, on the micrometer side. Now on the voltmeter side, which is the, hooked up to the digital gauge, I have 1.572 volts. So I'll go to my spreadsheet and I'll enter in the height, which is giving us a pressure via rho GH, and the volts. Let's do that. So in the spreadsheet, my microtector at zero gauge pressure, we said was 5 tenths plus 8 thousandths. And our volts were 1.572. So now we want to do the same measurement at, a different, at different flow rates. So to do that, we're going to apply a transformer voltage of increments of 10 starting at 20, 20, 20 volts through 80 volts. So let's do one measurement at 20 volts. So I'll go, by, go to my voltage source and change the dial to 20. You'll hear the flow starting. So now I want the needle to go back to 20 microamps because that's what our micrometer was zeroed at. So I'm pulling the micrometer out of the fluid until I get to 20 microamps. Now I can read this gauge again. It says we're at 5 tenths and we haven't quite hit the 40th marking yet so we're 0 40ths and I'm seeing it's about 20 one thousandths. So five tenths and twenty one thousandths. Then I'll go over to my volt voltmeter and I've got one point five nine seven volts. So I'll go to my computer. I have five tenths, twenty one thousandths, and one point five nine seven. Now, I would do the same process at 0, 20, 30, etc., up to 80. I'm going to turn the camera off and take the measurements for 30 through 70, and we'll do 80 together.